Materials provided by Tombow and Windsor Newton. In this learning tutorial, I'm going to travel to a completely foreign place, southern Utah, and I'm going to confront my four greatest artistic weaknesses, color, landscape, mixed media, and watercolor. I'm going to show you how I learn. My husband, Alex, has tons of family in Utah. We visit Salt Lake City pretty often for the holidays, and we even had our wedding here many years ago. So Utah is not new to me in that sense, but that's why it's been really surprising to me that on this trip, I'm finding that I'm getting to know Utah in a completely different way. Our first stop is Mount Pleasant. It's a small town in San Pete County. It's just about two hours south from Salt Lake City. You walk into downtown Mount Pleasant and you really feel like you've stepped back into the 1950s. There's the stuff you'd expect to see in a small, sleepy town. There's gas stations, banks, a pharmacy, but there's also a gun shop, a violin maker, and you can get a shake in town. I'm from the East Coast. I don't think it's a shake. It's basically soft serve ice cream served in a cup, which is put into a second cup with a spoon. Okay, you can call the shake if you want. In Mount Pleasant, you see handwritten signs everywhere, not just on storefronts, but also on the side of the roads. The landscape in Mount Pleasant, it's really ruled by little bushes. The trees are so short, they almost feel like tall bushes to me. The sky here is so much bigger than I've ever seen it anywhere in the world. Anywhere you look in any direction in Mount Pleasant, the sky takes up three quarters of what you see. I mean, it's to the point that the mountains and the landscape, they almost feel like accessories to the sky. And as quiet as it is in Mount Pleasant, you'll hear hummingbirds buzzing. There's grasshoppers that scatter like crazy the second you get close. There's so many things in the town that feel like they were left behind. A giant pile of tires sitting alone in a field there's rusty buckets that have holes in them. The fences here, they're crooked, they're mismatched. I mean, they almost feel like a patchwork quilt of fences. And the dirt roads, they blend into the cracked ground. There's almost no division between the two. The watercolor paper that you choose can completely make or break your experience. If you have watercolor paper that's too thin, that buckles too much, it just creates such a terrible experience. Get good quality watercolor paper if you can. One way to deal with watercolor paper that buckles too much, you can get what's called a watercolor block. Instead of being individual sheets, they're actually glued all across the four sides, except there's this one section right here, which is open, and you can just stick a palette knife underneath it and then pull it off. While you paint on it, the paper might buckle a little bit, but it's very, very minimal. The watercolor painting dries entirely. When you take it off the watercolor block, it's perfectly flat. There are two types of watercolor paper you can get. There's hot press and there's cold press. Hot press is basically paper that's very, very thin and smooth. I don't tend to like hot press so much for watercolor paper because I feel like it's a little bit too slippery. Cold press paper has a little bit of a texture to it, and so there's a little bit of resistance when you put your brush on the surface of the paper. Cold press paper also makes it a lot easier to get a wide range of textures with your brush because it does have a little bit of that grit. If you can afford it, you should really try to buy the professional quality paint. Of course, not everybody can afford that. And if you can only get student grade paints, that's totally fine. But if you can, it's really, really worth it. I really trust Windsor Newton for all of my paints. Their watercolor paints are totally stellar, high quality paints. You can get watercolor as cakes or as tubes. Cakes are really nice because lots of companies make these cute little portable sets that are really easy to carry around. Some people really like the cakes because they feel like it's a little bit less work. You don't have to squirt out the paints. But I know some people like having the option of the watercolor being very juicy and very soft because a cake is a rigid form. 
And so it's not like a nice juicy blob of wet watercolor. And there's the option to do that with the tubes. If you are painting on site and you're using tubes, what I do recommend is that the night before you go out and paint, take a plastic palette and squirt out each of the colors so that way they can dry overnight and you aren't having to carry this palette that's full of all these juicy, wet blobs of paint. It's just a lot easier in terms of getting yourself around. Palettes, same thing. I think it just is a matter of personal preference. Some people like to have ones that are very small because they're super easy to transport. I happen to really like having a lot of mixing space, so for me, this is a lot easier. But whatever works for you is best. My approach towards which colors to buy is the total opposite of oil painting. In oil painting, I like to have as few colors as possible. But in watercolor, I actually found the opposite experience, that I really liked having tons and tons of colors. I've got like four or five blues, five yellows, and I just found that with watercolor, the color mixing is just not as precise. I find that it's just faster if I have more options to choose from. The way the watercolor looks on your palette is really not accurate to the way the color is going to look when it's actually in your painting, because depending on how much water is in your brush, that color could come out really, really light and washy, or it could be a lot denser and darker. The way the watercolor comes out on your paper is super unpredictable. And that's why I really recommend having a scrap sheet of paper. Sometimes just in my sketchbook, you'll see I just have these little swatches of color. That's so that way I can test what the color is going to look like, but also how opaque or transparent that color is going to be. That way you're not brutally surprised when you put your mark down on your painting. There are so many different types of brushes out there, but I find that the diversity and range of brushes that are available for watercolor is so much harder than in any other paint material. I just know when I went to the art store and I was looking for watercolor brushes, I felt so overwhelmed. It was like, do I get a fan brush? Do I get a round brush? Do I get a flat brush? It was so confusing. I bought a bunch of watercolor brushes, but I actually had tons of these Sumi brushes lying around my studio. And I thought, oh, I'll just bring these along because I have experience using these. And I actually found that I really did not like the traditional watercolor brushes. I really preferred these Sumi brushes. And I think the reason why is because the watercolor brushes to me, they felt too specific and too stiff. Every single watercolor brush had a really particular type of shape, and I didn't feel that it had a lot of potential to transform itself into a different type of shape. I only ended up using these three Sumi brushes, and that was it. It was just too confusing to have so many brushes. Sumi brushes, they just feel really familiar. My mother does a lot of Chinese calligraphy, and every time she would take a trip to Taiwan, she'd come back with all these Sumi inks and all these different brushes. And so I just have amassed this gigantic collection of Sumi brushes. The Sumi brushes, they're a lot more voluptuous. I feel like the range of different types of marks that the Sumi brushes are capable of producing is so much bigger. You'd be amazed. You can get very, very thin, tiny strokes that you would never think a brush this large would be able to get. And that's because of the very, very fine point that this brush is capable of making. I think the trick with brush technique in watercolor is you have to be really conscious of how wet or how dry your brush is. A brush that's really loaded up with tons of water is going to be very puddly and very juicy, and it's really going to have a mind of its own. So if you work very wet with your brush, you really are relinquishing a lot of control. Dry brushing is the complete opposite. That's when you have barely any water in your brush. But what's really nice about that is the dryness of the brush makes it very easy to control your strokes. And so I find that I try to oscillate between the two, that I have a good range of very thin, very watery, washy, wet strokes, but then I can also layer the dry brush strokes on top of that.
cleaning your brushes with watercolor, so not a big deal. However, you will find situations where your brush is so much wetter than you want it to be. You just need to take out a little bit of the water. So what I found was actually a wet sponge was really good for that. And the watercolor, it's so thin that it doesn't matter how dirty the sponge gets. Another option you can use is a paper towel if you just need to grab something real quick. Although these I don't like so much because they get really, really wet and soaked with water. The sponge is just so much more durable, it lasts longer. Sometimes I'll put down a mark on the painting and the mark is so dark and I go, oh, I don't want that, it's way too much. I just take this paper towel, I just dab the painting really quickly and that usually gets rid of it. As someone who's lived on the East Coast of the US for pretty much my whole life, in my mind, rocks are boring. <laughs> I mean, for me, unless you're at the Harvard Natural History Museum in their rock collection, rocks are boring. The rocks in Mount Pleasant, they're not boring. You see when you walk around the fields, there's just gigantic rock piles. And they almost feel like these accidental monuments that just sprung up spontaneously in the middle of the field. I guess the moment that I knew the rocks here were really something special, there was this one time where we found this huge pile in the middle of the field and my kids spent a solid 10 minutes just walking on these rocks. I mean, it was like the rock pile was this obstacle course that they were trying to conquer. Trying out an art material that you have very little or no experience with can be incredibly challenging. It's always really awkward, and I always feel like a total klutz. So much of the process is just trying things out and saying, you know what, that did not work out so well, or you know what, this was okay, I think I'll try that again. I've seen so many students and former students who were just head over heels for alcohol-based markers, but I didn't like any of those alcohol-based brush pens because the tips were really big, they felt really floppy. That's why when Tombow came out with these alcohol-based brush pens, it was like a best of both worlds. It was a stiffer tip that I'm much more accustomed to, but it also has the alcohol base, which creates very transparent colors, which are so wonderful for blending and layering colors. Watercolor is definitely my most feared painting material, and I feel so bad about it because it's such a quintessential painting material for fine artists. In my high school art class, I had this watercolor assignment, so I did this just crap painting of these three Greek goddesses, I kept using the watercolor like I wished it was acrylic paint. So I was squirting out these big blobs of paint, I was applying it very thickly, and after that experience, I thought, that's it, I'm never using watercolor again. I hate that material. I also wanted to give mixed media a shot. There are so many traps with mixed media, though. I see artists using mixed media and the media are treated so separately that the artwork really transforms into this really awful tacky patchwork quilt. I needed to find a sweet spot where the two media could be visibly separate but that could also blend well together. One of the reasons why I chose the Tombow alcohol-based brush pens with watercolor is because both of those materials are inherently transparent. They're really gonna interact very well together. When I started with markers, it was very reassuring because the markers are really easy to control, they're very neat, and I felt very secure about the initial outline of the drawing. It was nice, though, to start a piece with watercolor because the watercolor just has this very spontaneous, very gestural, very energetic feel to it. And that was a nice way to just jumpstart a piece, just getting right in there and being really bold with my marks. I tried to really keep an eye on the balance between the watercolor and the alcohol brush pens. I remember thinking I was doing pretty well with the watercolor, but then later on I ended up adding so much marker that I just completely obliterated anything that was worth looking at. It's not just the size of these rocks that makes them stand out. The rocks here in Mount Pleasant, they're so painterly. And to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense to say that because rocks are rigid objects, so how could they possibly look loose and gestural like a painting. 
I think so much of it is in the surface of these rocks. I see the transitions and the textures. It's almost like the rock is telling you its autobiography, its history through the surface and its textures. Normally, I have to work really hard to see beyond the literal color of an object. But with these rocks, everything was so clear. I would look at the shadows and you would see these blues and lavenders just leap out. I mean, I've never seen colors like that that made themselves so easy to find. And it's not just the rocks themselves that I was intrigued by. It was also these pockets of space that were in between the rocks. And it just made me think, what if I could go in there? Where would that pocket of space take me? There was this beautiful little landscape right outside our cabin in Woodstow, Utah. And there was one day I sat down and I thought to myself, okay, let's do a full out composition. Let's paint the whole landscape. And I really was in the mindset that I was gonna finish this watercolor painting. I definitely had a plan for this landscape before I started painting. I knew I wanted to paint something which really pushed atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective is a basic concept in space where the objects in the foreground have very high contrast, they are very crisp, they're articulate, they have a lot of detail, and then the further back you move into the space, objects become a lot more blurry, their contrast becomes a lot lower, and things just become a lot more vague and suggestive. An artist who I use a lot to illustrate atmospheric perspective is Caspar David Friedrich, because he really was a master of showing that contrast between the foreground and the background. The thing about atmospheric perspective is it's not enough to just think about it. You have to really, really push it as a concept. Had I painted the trees just as I saw them, the atmospheric perspective would not have worked at all. If I painted those trees as very, very dark, which they were, that's exactly how they looked, those trees in the distance would not have pushed back at all. You just cannot paint the landscape as you see it. You do it that way, none of that stuff with the atmospheric perspective and sense of space is really gonna come across. I wanted to push the atmospheric perspective, but I noticed as I kept working on it that I started getting really, really picky in terms of the details in the foreground. And also, I relied so much on the darks. It was really quite embarrassing now that I go back and look at it. And I know why, because I'm somebody who usually works in black and white. And if I'm not working in black and white, I'm usually working monochromatically, which is with just one color. And so I'm somebody who loves dark and who loves contrast. And so of course, I'm totally gonna lean on that when I'm working with a new material like watercolor. And so when I stepped back and I looked at this first version of the Widstow landscape, I was just horrified by the amount of black that was in it, the amount of detail, how I did not push the contrast behind the foreground and the background. And I was just so mad that I had become so picky with the painting. Like I hated all the details that I put in the foreground. I felt like the whole piece totally fragmented and there's all these little sections that I did not like. When I'm working with a material I'm not super confident with, it makes me feel like I have to over explain things because I worry that, oh, well maybe my audience didn't get it. It's actually, it's a lot like being a teacher where you're like, did the students really understand? I think I better say it three more times. I was so mad at myself for overworking that painting that I thought, okay, let's paint that same subject again, but I'm gonna stop myself way too soon. I'm gonna stop myself so early that it's gonna be really unfulfilling to stop at that point. But I knew I had to do that. I knew that I had to have a version that was the complete opposite extreme of this first version. I did that painting, I spent just a few minutes on it, and yes, it was really unfulfilling to work that way and to look at that piece and to think, oh my God, all these things are unresolved, I really gotta fix this and this, but, when I put those two versions of that Woodstone landscape side by side, I looked at them and I thought, you know what? There's gotta be a sweet spot here where I can have 
some of those elegant details, but also maintain that freshness and that spontaneity. Through these two versions, I realized some really key components of watercolor. The tendency to overwork your watercolor painting is so high, and learning how to stop yourself before you overwork the painting, really difficult to do, but you gotta do it. What I started focusing more on was what I was not going to paint. There's this huge fence with all these wood pillars, but I'm only gonna paint two of those. I'm gonna leave out these other three on the right-hand side. Whenever I paint from life, I always do a lot of squinting. In fact, I look like I'm in a really bad mood. People call it my painting face. But I do that and I try really, really hard to view my subject as a series of abstract shapes. And I realize with landscape, it's like that, but on total steroids. You have to look at it abstractly because if you go in with the mindset that you're gonna paint every leaf and every little strand, you're gonna go crazy or you're never gonna finish that painting. Traveling is so incredibly unpredictable and I definitely have a love-hate relationship with that sometimes. There were times when I would know that, okay, I got two hours, I can focus, I can relax, I can really work on this painting at my own pace and not stress. There were other times though, when I literally just had minutes. The best example of that was we were traveling through the city called Green River, and my husband was getting very sleepy, so he said, okay, we gotta stop so I can get some coffee. We stop at this truck stop. I looked over on the side, and there was this propane tank that was painted like a watermelon. And I thought, what would compel anybody to paint their propane tank like a watermelon? And I realized as I looked next to the propane tank that there was a watermelon stand there. The woman there told me that Green River is famous for their melons and they have this melon fair and it's a big part of their town's identity. And the melon stand was very strange. It was very awkwardly situated that it felt very isolated from the truck stand. It was really off in its own universe. The thing is, my husband was getting coffee and I thought, oh my gosh, I do not have time to do this. But I was like, I can't pass that up. This is the coolest thing. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna do it. Sometimes I like having that pressure. There's no time to stop and think. You can't second guess yourself. And I just drew furiously as quickly as I could. And then 10 minutes later, we were off.